Chapter 13 of Autumn Leaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autumn Leaves, edited by Anna Wells Abbott. Chapter 13 Miseries, Number 4 Fresh Air. I believe the world has gone quite crazy on the subject of fresh air. In the next century, people will think they must sleep on the housetops, I suppose, or camp out in tents in primitive style. Nothing is talked about but ventilators and air tubes and chimney drafts. One would suppose that fireplaces were invented expressly for cooling and airing a room, instead of heating it. There was no such fuss when I was young. In those good old times, these airy notions had not come into fashion. Where the loose window sashes rattled at every passing breeze, and the wind chased the smoke down the wide-mouthed chimney, nobody complained of being stifled. There were no furnaces then to spread a summer heat to every corner of the house. No, indeed. We ran shivering through the long, windy entries, all wrapped in shawls, and hugging ourselves to retain the friendly warmth of the fire as long as possible. Far from devising ways of letting in the air, we tried hard to keep it out by stuffing the cracks with cotton and closely curtaining the windows in bed. Even then, the ice in the wash basin and the electricity which made our hair literally stand on end in the process of combing, and the gradual transformation of fingers into thumbs, showed but too plainly that the wintry air had penetrated our defenses. When we crowded joyfully round a crackling, sparkling wood fire, even while our faces glowed with the intense heat, cold shivers were creeping down our backs, and sudden drafts from an opening door set our teeth chattering. I often wished myself on a spit to revolve slowly before the fire until thoroughly roasted. Not from any want of air, I assure you. We children were always breaking panes of glass on the bitterest days, and the glacier was never known to come under a week to replace them. Why people should wish to revive and live through again the miseries of such a frost-nipped childhood, I cannot imagine. I, for one, love a snug house, even a warm house. I'm of a chilly temperament, and subject to rheumatism, horrible colds, etc. Fresh air is my bane. I banish all books on the subject from my table. I studiously avoid all notorious fresh air lovers, or try in every way to bring over the poor, misguided mortals to my views, but it is of no use. Fresh air is the fashion, and is run to extremes, as all fashions must be. I call in a physician, lo! Fresh air is recommended as a tonic. I give a party. Of course my windows are all thrown open, and foolish young girls in the thinnest of white muslins are standing in the draft, and such a whirlwind is raised by the flirting of fans and the rush of the dancers that I am blown like a dry leaf into a corner where I stand shivering and making rueful attempts to appear smiling and hospitable. I go out to pass a social afternoon with a friend and am set down in a room just above the freezing point, with a little crack opened in the window, and all the doors flying to change the air. I ride in the omnibus, and am almost choked with my bonnet strings, such a furious draft meets me in the face, and when, with infinite pains, I have secured the only tolerably warm corner, my next neighbor becomes very faint and must have the window open. Even the poor babies are not safe from this popular insanity. You may see the little victims any day taking an airing with their little red noses and watery eyes peeping forth from under the cap and feathers. The old-fashioned blanket in which the baby was done up head and all, like a bundle, is thrown aside. The child is not quite so often carried upside down, I suppose under the new system, but what difference does it make whether the poor thing is smothered or frozen to death? I shall never forget a long journey I took once with a friend who was raving mad on the subject of fresh air and cold water. Every morning the windows were thrown open wide and the blinds flung back with an energetic bang while a stiff wintry wind whirled everything about the room and flapped the curtains against the ceiling. And there she stood, declaring herself exhilarated while her nose and lips turned from red to blue and the tears ran down her cheeks. I always took to flight, 
Afterwards, the poor auto-martyr went out to walk before breakfast, scornfully rejecting all offers of furs and extra wrappings. Oh dear, no! She never thought of muffs, tippets, snow boots, but as encumbrances fit for extreme old age and infirmity. She always walked fast, and the more the wind blew, the warmer she felt, I might be assured. As soon as she had gone, I established myself in comfort by the side of a glowing grate, happy but for dreading her return. She came in dreadfully fresh and breezy from the outer air, very energetic, very noisy, and fully bent upon stirring me up and making me take exercise. After snapping the door open and slamming it behind her with a clap that greatly disturbed my nerves, she exclaimed in a stentorian voice, Oh dear me, I shall die in such an oven. My dear child, you have no idea how hot it is. And the first thing I knew, up would go a window with a crash that made the weights rattle. It might rain or shine, whether made no difference to this inveterate air seeker. Many a time has she come in all dripping and tracking the carpet, brushed carelessly against me with her wet garments, and finally enveloped me with the steam arising from them as they hung around my fire. It roused my indignation that she should make herself and everybody else so uncomfortable, and then glory in the deed as if it were indubitably and indisputably praiseworthy. She was so good-natured, however, and so happy in her delusion, that I could not find it in my heart to remonstrate very vehemently, except when she would make me listen to her interminable lectures upon the importance, the necessity, of fresh air, and the effect of a snug, cozy room upon the blood, the heart, the lungs, the head, and, as I verily believe she hinted, the temper. I know I lost all control of mine long before she finished, but whether it was the want of fresh air in practice, or too much of it in theory, I leave you to imagine. My friend always carried a small thermometer in her trunk, which she consulted a dozen times an hour, in order to regulate the temperature of the room. Alas for me, if the quicksilver rose above sixty! I devoutly hoped she would leave it behind in some of our numerous stopping places, and with an eye to that possibility, I must confess, I hung it in the most out-of-the-way corners I could find but it seemed to be on her mind continually. She never forgot it, and always packed it very carefully, too. I asked her two or three times to let me put it in my trunk, where I had slyly arranged a nice little place full of hard surfaces and sharp corners, but she always had plenty of room. I believe my zealous friend is now residing at the seashore, freezing in the cold sea winds and losing her breath every morning in the briny wave, under the strange illusion that she's improving her health. End of Miseries Number 4 Fresh Air Recording by Lynn Handler